Welcome once again to our summer chapel. We hope that you've been blessed so far by what God has been doing here at South Florida Bible College. Let us begin in prayer. Father, we thank you so much once again for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. We pray that you would just come in and uh, fill us and touch us, Lord God, that we would completely be moved by you, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that wherever we are, we get to worship um, together. Although we can't meet face to face right now, may we be together in spirit, for we are one body in you. We thank you so much for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We can't wait to meet you or see you again, I should say. Um, but at the same time, we're getting ready to get into our worship session. So why don't you worship with us? Be blessed. So 
God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. Yeah. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my strength. And I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you. I will love you, Lord, my strength. And I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. But I'm here all 
searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know Just what we need before we Say oh, oh you're good You found It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, you're good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, because you are Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever applies to you in the time that you're watching this chapel service. But nonetheless, I welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and honestly, I'm sure it's been a difficult year for you, regardless of the severity, as we've all really struggled with something of another during the season, even, it's the wait, even if it's the weightiness of our friends. A burden of loss, a burden of frustration, a burden of uncertainty, all these things plague us during this time. Even in my short life, um, I have not seen such chaos, such division, such hate that we see today. And to say that it is also within the church is a tragic reality that we must all face as Christians. I ask, what do we do about such chaos today? How do we help those around us into peace and love? To whom do we turn in these difficult times? I implore and beg you not to seek trite and cliche answers, but to really search within your hearts. Increase in your understanding of self and see how God transforms and uses you to promote peace and love in His character on this earth. Today I want to turn to a familiar passage of Scripture, and it's found in Mark 12. And I want to discuss the implications of this passage for our theme this semester, I Pledge Allegiance to the Cross of Jesus Christ. We've only heard a few messages thus far, but they have truly been great ones, and the implications of them reverberate into what seems like every area of our lives. 
in a time when allegiances are all we're talking about, in a time when political affiliation is most important, in a time when allegiances are all we have been talking about, in a time when our political affiliation is most important, even in a time when our opinions on COVID have become what seems to be theology. In a time like this, I ask, to whom is your allegiance pledged? I encourage you not to focus on a spoken answer to this question, but one that's reflective of your actions, your time, your priorities. What do your actions and your priorities say about who your allegiance is pledged to? Is your life reflective of fully pledging allegiance to the Christ, cross of Jesus Christ? Or has something else taken dominance in your life, in your conversations, and in your relationships? I ask again, to whom is your allegiance pledged? While you're pondering deeply on that question, let us begin reading in Mark chapter 12, and we'll begin in verse 14. The word says, They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Today my message can be titled, Rendering Ourselves Unto God. Rendering Ourselves Unto God. Let's pray. Dear Father, I give you thanks for our chapel messages this semester, Lord God, and the mighty theme you've placed on our hearts to pledge allegiance to the cross of Jesus Christ alone. Dear Father, I pray that this message today spoken is one that is honoring to you, one that pushes us back to allegiance to you puts you at the priority, at the forefront of our lives, and not to the back burner, Lord God. I pray you impact our hearts and minds for a life that's completely dedicated and turned to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In this passage we just read, it's evident that there is at least some political turmoil going on during the time the chief priest asked Jesus' question. In reality, I don't know a time or place who hasn't at least had some political turmoil. We can definitely relate as well to what's going on. Political turmoil and tension in today's day and age is very common. Never have I honestly seen Christians disagree with each other so strongly than today. Theological disputes are nothing compared to the seemingly irreconcilable political differences we have as Christians. But here in the passage, we have the Pharisees and Herodians sent by the chief priests in order to trap Jesus, the Savior of humanity. And in reality, if you look at it, this is a conversation held between religious leaders, between Christian leaders, not between politicians, not between government officials, but between Christians, between pastors, preachers, and teachers, and our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And as we see, the intentions of the Pharisees and the Herodians was not a good one. Jesus knew they were seeking to trap him. If Jesus said yes, the patriots of the time would reject him. If he said no, he'd be arrested by the Romans. The chief priests were already plotting against Christ to see him arrested, to see him imprisoned, or to even see him crucified at this point. But Jesus did what he does best and flips the script. He asks the Pharisees and the Herodians, whose image is on this coin? They respond, well, Caesar's, of course. He says, render unto Caesar what is due Caesar, but also render unto God what is due God. This, of course, leaves them amazed as we read at the end and very likely convicted at their transgressions at the same time. But what possible implications can this passage have on our theme? I believe there's a clear occurrence going on in this passage, but how does it apply to us today? Based on this verse, it's evident that Christ does instruct us to give something back to our countries. This is a hard fact for many Christians to get over. Nonetheless, Christ tells us, render unto Caesar 
what is Caesar's? Give unto Caesar what is owed him. What Christ is saying here is to give back to the government what is owed him. The immediate question I have is then, what exactly is owed them? I don't want to give the government any more than is required. Who would want to send back more money than they actually owe to the IRS in taxes? I'm not familiar with one person who longs to do so. But in the same vein, I wouldn't want to give them less than what is required. I'm sure they wouldn't respond well if I sent them a box of chocolates and a little paper that had an IOU written on it, regardless of my well-thought-out intentions. The IRS wouldn't be too happy about that. Even so, unfortunately, Christ does not give us much insight on what is owed to our governments in this passage other than taxes. And honestly, there's a lot that we owe back to our country. We must render our citizenship. We must render our taxes. We must render our lawfulness. We will give to the government that which they have stamped as ours to give. Our voices, our income, our right to vote. We will render and give all of these things to them. We owe our government that. I ask again, whose image is on that coin? Whose stamp is on that coin? Caesar's, then give it to him. The coin is not ours to concern ourselves with. It is of this world. But please remember that we are individuals in this world, and we are in this country, but we are not of this world and of this country. 1 John chapter 2 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Hmm. Do not love man-made institutions. Do not love your nation. Do not love your political party. You see, the point I'm trying to make is not that these things cannot be of importance in your life. They can. But that you should not pledge your allegiance to these things and put them at priorities in your lives. Our allegiance, that which we surrender and belong to, should be pledged to God first and foremost. The reality is that in America, we fall and pray to a nationalistic pride that engulfs many nations, a pride that has influenced our Christian living. Our politicians and flags have made their way into the church, yet the church continues to have such a small impact on the world around us at times. We've long had a complicated identity crisis with formation and governmental ideologies that have influenced our Christian life in negative ways. The world around us should be influenced by our Christian living and never the other way around. We must learn to embody what Jesus is showing us in this passage in Mark 12. Yes, we have earthly responsibilities. Just as we must render unto Caesar what is his, we also have a responsibility to our nation as I described earlier. Jesus asks, whose image is on this coin? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But Jesus continues even more importantly, but render to God what is God's. Jesus continually reminds us that we should give the government what we owe it, but we are also to give unto God what is stamped in the image of God, just as that coin was stamped in the image of Caesar. So what is that? What is stamped in the image of God? I ask you to look around. <laughs> Even if you're the only one in that room watching this video, you will not fail to see the image of God stamped on your life. Think of the people you've seen this past week, this past year, in the entirety of your whole lifetime. All of those people you've seen, all of those faces have the image of God stamped on them. They're people from every nationality, every tribe, every language background. Dare I say people we don't like. <laughs> They all are stamped with the image of God. And that is what we are called to give to God, to render to Him our entire lives. Have we truly rendered to God what is due to Him? Or have we all been too consumed with our politics and personal opinions to notice our immeasurable debt to God and what we owe Him? Again, render unto God what is God's. With an understanding that all of humanity has a stamp of God on their lives, we should approach our relationships with others in ways that are God-honoring and uniting rather than selfish and divisive. 
The reality is that there is so much brokenness in the world that should unite us all to action. How can we be so focused on our political persuasions that we forget about the orphan and the widow? How can we be so caught up with our vote on this bill or that one that we have forgotten about the brothers and sisters that are hurting and destitute around this world? In Myanmar, in Venezuela, in North Korea, all around this world we see suffering that should unite us, that should bring us together, but yet we focus on our differences. We are called to stand for the weak, the lonely, the orphan, the widow, not Republican or Democrat, not liberal or conservative. So I ask you again, SFBC, who will you pledge allegiance to? As you think about an answer to this question, remember the cost. Remember what God is asking you to render to Him. It's not something simple. Think about that and answer this question with the honesty of your heart. For me, I choose to pledge allegiance to the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank you and God bless.